start like like now. I'm Bob Darrell, an alcoholic. Hi, Bob. Welcome back. Now, since there's not everybody's here, I can unleash the secret. Yes. No. <laughs> I'm such a wise guy. <laughs> One, before we move on to step eight and nine, which I think are the really big deals in AA, uh, I wanted to comment on the seven-step prayer in the middle of page 76. And it is a reminder when we say to God, I, I am now willing for you to have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness. To you and my fellows, grant may strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. We've then completed step seven. I'm not asking him for anything that will serve me. That Alcoholics Anonymous is not a selfish program. It's not a self-help program. It's not a program of self-improvement. It's a program of self-abandonment and service. I'm asking God to take the things away that stand in the way of my usefulness, period, and I don't even get an opinion of what those are. I am advocating along with my will, my judgment and perception and opinion of everything, and now it's in his hands. And I just trust that he will remove the things that stand in the way of me helping his kids. And I think Alcoholics Anonymous is a process where by which I am divinely crafted by my sickness and defects to be uniquely and divinely useful to other people that are exactly like me. And when that's why in Alcoholics Anonymous it says later on that our real purpose is to, to fit, and sometimes I think, and refit and refit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us because we have a primary purpose number one purpose in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that is to help other alcoholics, people like us. And in, in the carrying out of that primary purpose, I get free from the bondage of self. And I get free from me and my, and God's able to move in in my absence, absence and, and start doing amazing things in my life. Amazing things. Um, no one in Alcoholics Anonymous is rendered white as snow. Uh, not even Bill Wilson. I have a I have a tre tremendous letter here uh, written to it was a response written from Bill Wilson to a group in Chicago that really raked Bill over the coals and took his inventory very harshly. And Bill was not perfect, but in his imperfection, he had a degree of humility that is just amazing. And here's his response to being raked over the coals. And listen to what he says to this group in Chicago in 1960. He says that you seem disillusioned with me personally. Maybe a new and painful experience for you, but many members have had that experience with me. Most of their pain has been caused not only by my several shortcomings, but by their own insistence on placing me a drunk trying to get along with other folks upon a completely illusionary pedestal, a station which no fallible person could possibly occupy. I'm sure you will understand that I've never heard, held myself out to anyone as either a saint or a superman. I have repeatedly and truthfully said that AA is full of people who have made more spiritual progress than I ever or can make that in some areas of living I have made some decided gains, and in others I seem to have stood still, and in still in others I may have even gone backwards. I am sorry you are disillusioned, but I am happy that even I have found a life here. Bill Wilson, 1960. He never defended himself once. When you're surrendered, you don't have to be defended. That's where the real humility is. Not in, humility is not in perfection. It's in an honest recognition of God's grace in your life and who you are. And what a tremendous, uh, tremendous thing. 
And Bill, like anyone who, if you, and, and I know that there's people in this room that do a lot of service. And if you do a lot of service consistently, somewhere along the line, you realize you've got a target on your back. <laughs> and that's just the way it is. And people will fire at you and they'll accuse you of doing it for wrong reasons and they'll accuse all kinds of stuff. My sponsor is Clancy. I, I go I go travel around the world and I mention his name and people just will go out of their way to tell me and they've never met him, but they got all kinds of judgments against him. I said, Well you ever had coffee with him? Well no, but he's a blah, blah, blah. I said, Really, is he? How where, what's your source of information? Oh, I just know. Really? Wow. Psychic members of AA. <laughs> I worked on the docks in Maine and on lobster boats for a while, and it was years ago when I was drinking. Good job for a drinker. And on all the lobster boats, they have a, a basket that's about this high and about this big around. And what happens is when we pull the traps, um, we get crabs get in the traps. And the lobster fishermen don't want the crabs, so they just throw them in this bucket. And it will fill up in a day. It will fill. It'll have like 150, 200 crabs, and and they don't put a, a lid on it, and they're scrambling to get out, and they're climbing up the sides. And I'm watching it, and these crabs are getting right up to the edge. And I'm telling this guy they're going to get out, and he says, Man. "I said you need to put a cover on there. I'm telling you, they're because they're climbing over each other. They're going to get out." He says, "Nah." I said, look, they're, they're almost out now. I'm telling you. He says, watch. I started watching. Every time a crab would get right to the point where it's just about to get out, the other crabs couldn't stand it, and they'd pull him back down. <laughs> I, think we, I think this is one of the biggest crab pots in the, United, in the world right here. So when it says, are you willing to go to any lengths to serve God and help his kids? Sometimes you have to be like Bill Wilson. You have to get people take shots at you. We never defend ourselves. We just look to the next person we can help. Now I get to talk a little bit about step eight. Um, I, I think this is the hardest thing we ever do. I, I mean, objectively, uh, up until this point in the process, there is nothing I've really had to do that puts me at very high risk. I mean, I've had to, a little bit of risk in the fifth step. But, you know, we check these people out. We're pretty sure. We're not taking our fifth step with a gossip. You know, we've checked it out. There's, we've we've minim, minimized our exposure here pretty good. But step eight and nine, man, going out and seeking out all the people I've ripped off, the guys I've dimed out, the people I've really hurt and stolen from. The, I, I got situations that were going to put me in prison. And people are talking about me facing all this stuff. And it I would hear people talk about amends. I just want to bolt out of AA when I was new. I it was just too big. It was too much. I can't first of all, I'm not gonna live long enough to ever make enough money to pay back what I owed. I'm not it's more money than I will make in a lifetime. I mean, for God's sakes, if I knew I was gonna have to pay this stuff back, I wouldn't have stolen so much. I mean, that's really. And my experience with looking at step eight and nine as a newcomer was very similar. I would imagine to this experience of a kid, say, in the fourth or fifth grade that were to sit down and look at the exams he must pass in order to graduate from high school. A kid in the fourth or fifth grade looking at those exams is going to feel like he might as well just quit school. I'm never going to understand those questions. But a funny thing happens if he shows up every day and does his next assignment and his next homework. By the time he gets to the end of the 12th grade, he has everything in place within him to pass those tests. And Alcoholics Anonymous is a synchronistic place. We talk in AA about the realm of the spirit. In the realm of the spirit, the impossible just takes a little longer. We have a principle called synchronicity that Carl Jung was the first person to ever talk about it. And a synchronistic universe is a universe that is ultimately accommodating. It's a view of a universe that, let's say you're at point A and you need to get to point B and you can't. 
There's an abyss between A and B that makes it impossible. Throw your hands up. It's hopeless. I can't get there, and yet I need to get there. From the moment of desire, and the word desire comes from two Greek words that have passed into the Old English that means of the Father. From the moment of desire, the universe starts rearranging itself slowly until the impossible becomes possible. You don't have to sit in AA meetings very long to hear synchronistic stories of God's grace, of, of people that could never, had restraining orders, never see their kids. And now, did you see them in the meeting? They had their kids with them. And you hear, that was impossible. We hear stories, we, we take it for granted, the miracles in AA. How many times we hear people say, you know, you go, you go to coffee with a bunch of people and say, hey, remember Joe, the guy who's living in the bushes behind the AA club? Yeah, yeah. Do you know he bought a house? Yeah, yeah. What's for dinner? I mean, you know, it's, uh, yeah. we, it's almost blase after a while. But God's grace works. And Al- Alcoholics Anonymous, that fear that I had of facing the amends, but I had nowhere to go. Uh, has been with us ever since the beginning. As a matter of fact, I believe that Alcoholics Anonymous was actually formed on one man's eighth step. In Mother's Day weekend, 1935, a desperate stockbroker who was sober less than a half, less than six months, just a, I think five months probably. I just had his oh, his whole world fall apart, his one chance to get back on his feet. He had no sponsor, no AA meetings, no nothing. He's in a strange town. He's just about out of money as enough for maybe to get drunk if he wanted to, but not even really enough to pay his hotel bill and get back to New York. And he uh, believed something. He believed that maybe if he could find someone to help, he would be okay. And he started calling people, and he found this woman who knew a doctor who really was in bad shape and uh, he couldn't see that doctor at the moment he was taking a nap under the dining room table but he said tomorrow <laughs> come by the I'll bring, get him over he will you come over to the Cyberling gatehouse where I'm living now and she's a little estranged from her husband living in the gatehouse and I'll have him here and they came over there and met he didn't want to go his his son uh, Smitty was Smitty Jr was a really good friend of mine he'd spent time at my house at a couple of occasions and I used to love to hear him talk about the stories. He drove the car with his dad in the back seat and his mom sitting up front. His dad didn't want to go. He, he was guilty. He just drunk up Mother's Day. I mean, he really screwed the pooch on this one. I mean, he was really in a lot of trouble. And Ann was a strong woman, so he don't want to go, but he's going. You know, he's going to go listen to this Yankee talk to him about his drinking. He don't want to go. He said, don't 15 minutes, please don't leave me in there more than 15 minutes with that guy talking to me about my drinking. Don't, 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They went into the library, this little tiny room in the Cyberling Gatehouse, and it's almost four hours later, I think, that they came out, and, and Bob came out with his arm around Bill Wilson, and he was lit up. He was lit up, and he said to Ann, and his son was still sitting there, he said, I've never heard anybody talk like this. He said, this guy knows his business. He went in there and never heard anything like it because Bill Wilson never once talked to Bob about Bob's drink, and Bill Wilson talked to Bill to Bob about Bill Wilson's drinking. And for the first time, something miraculous happened. An alcoholic that was all alone and different and unique and hopeless connected with another alcoholic. And it was and it lit him up. And, and he, Bill started outlining this, this newly formed program he was kind of putting together. He's gleaning from some things Silkworth had told him and th- uh, things he had found in the Oxford group. And he was putting this deal together, and, and Bob liked it all. He liked the, 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 spe- the prayer meditation. He liked the confession of shortcomings. And he liked the help in others, but he refused to do the immense thing. He dug his heels in. He said, you know, I, I'm a I'm a." proctologist and doctor in this town I've ruined, have just about ruined my reputation I'm just going to leave that stuff alone and consequently Dr. Bob Smith drank again and on, he went to a convention in Atlantic City uh, he was so drunk coming back that the, he was comatose, the conductor didn't want to know what to, know what to do with him so they just laid him on the ground of the platforms the pl- laid him on the platform at Akron Station 
His office manager came down to the rescue again, as she had many times before, and got him up, got him uh, back to this, eventually back to the house on Ardmore Street, and he was out of it. He came to on what most historians, and some of them don't agree on this date. They've, I know some guys did research and are sure it's a, it must be a different date, but the accepted date was he came to early in the morning on June 10th, 1935, Came to like like I come to after a long drinking around the clock, you know, shaking, jumping out of your skin kind of deal. Bad shape. He says, what day is it? And they say June 10th. And he says, oh, my God, it can't be June 10th. I have a surgery to perform the morning of June 10th. Dr. Bob was a proctologist. You can use your imagination about what kind of surgery it might have been. And and he's like this. And Bill Wilson doesn't know what to do with him. So Bill gets him a couple sedatives, gives him a sedative and some, a couple bottles of beer just to – because he, you know, you, he, could, he could thread a, a needle in a sewing machine he was shaking so bad. Could, can't send a guy like that. Imagine the patient laying there watching your doctor come in like that. So they gave him just enough to calm his nerves down. It was a frightening thing and sent him into the surgery. And that surgery was over fairly, fairly quickly. Um, Nobody knows what happened to the patient. Now, it says somewhere in AA literature he lived. I don't know. I'd like to know. Did he whistle when he walked or what? We don't know. <laughs> but he came out of that surgery still in the early, fairly early in the morning of June 10th, and he disappeared. And he didn't come back all that morning, all that afternoon, all that evening. And it was close to midnight when Dr. Bob Smith came back to the house on Ardmore Street. And his son said he came back and he looked different. Something was different. And everybody had been afraid all day that he went out drinking. Eh, you know, sure, they gave him a couple of beers and said, he to, you know, he probably set him off. But he wasn't drinking. He hadn't drank at all, not a drop. He was out he's spending the whole day searching out everyone that he owed amends to and facing, walking through the fear and facing them. And consequently, Dr. Bob Smith never took another drink again the rest of his natural life. And in the, in the mere decade and a half that he lived before his death, he low estimates as he helped uh, over 5,000 people personally. And then they helped people who helped people who helped people. And I would venture to guess that we are in this room indirectly as a result of one man finally becoming willing to go to any lengths. And when it says in the book on page 76, at the bottom of the, the, the second to last paragraph in italics, it says, remember, it was agreed at the beginning we would go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. They're talking about step eight and nine. Now, treatment centers over the years and diff well-intentioned people have turned that into being willing to go to any lengths means being willing not to drink and go to meetings. But that's not really what they're talking about. They're talking about really the most difficult part, I think, of this process is willing to go out and face people that you don't know if they're going to hit you with a baseball bat. You're going to, and, and you're, you're going to have to start paying them money. And I don't know. Isn't it? It's a funny dynamic. They don't wait until you're flush to pay people back. They always oh, got to pay them back when you're really struggling the most. Right? And every alcohol, everybody wants to say, well... Maybe one day if I hit the lottery. <laughs> well, you probably won't stay sober long enough to do that if you don't start chipping away at this stuff. We most of us sell our integrity a nickel at a dime at a time, and we buy it back a nickel at a dime at a time. And it's a struggle in early sobriety. And I think sometimes it's supposed to be. I think this is in step eight and nine is when I really start to exercise my trust muscle with God. It's where I really learn that I some there's something here that's got my back. When I push myself aside and face people that I'm terrified of facing and pay money that I'm afraid to pay because I need it, it seems so desperately because I got so much financial insecurity. But those of us that are able to do this, great, great, great things come to pass. Great things. Um I I uh, I, could, uh, I, got, I could tell you a bunch of stories on step. I got to pick one real quick. We're gonna let this bleed over. Oh, we are. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. Okay. 
it was we were willing to go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. Page seventy nine is a paragraph that if I think if they were ever to make a sales pamphlet to, in order to sell people on the idea of making amends, this would be the anti sales pamphlet uh, for for some people. It says. The top of 79 says, although these reparations take innumerable forms, there are some general principles we find guiding, reminding ourselves that we have decided to go to any lengths, there it is again, to find a spiritual experience. We ask that we be given the strength and direction to do the right thing. And here's, here's the part that's a little frightening. No matter what the personal consequences may be. Does that mean I'm not part of others? Yeah, that's right. There's that uh, where who somebody ca- years ago saw a loophole. And loophole says, "Well, aren't I another? Except when to do so would harm them or others. Aren't I another? No, other is other than you. <laughs> right? We may lose our position or reputation or face jail, but we are willing. We have to be. We must not shrink in anything." Tough step. I think this is really where you find out if, if your trust in God and your willingness in AA is, is talk or not. It's really, this is really, you know, I know Father Ed Dowling says step six separates the men from the boys. You know, I think where the rubber meets the road, it's really step eight. It's the wheelbarrow step. It's the, this is where you get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> this is really where you get in the wheelbarrow. Yeah. Are you willing to, are you willing to act as if, that if you do the right thing, that you're going to be safe and protected, even though your head's exploding on you about how awful it's going to be. And I'll tell you something I've discovered over the years. The, the more fear that I have to walk through in order to make the amends, the greater reward. And I've seen that consistently in myself and also in the people I've sponsored and other people I know around AA. There's a, uh, I don't know why it's like that. Uh, there's not a great reward to making amends to people I know we're already going to take it well and it's not a big deal. Where the great things happen is where the ones I'm afraid to face. And then I finally trust God enough to face them. And I get to be wrong. What a miraculous thing. I get to be wrong again. Because my head told me they're going to beat me up. My head told me I'm going to go to prison. My head told me I can't survive these payments. My head, my head has never been right. And I get to be wrong again. And I, I and what's the great call? What's the great cry of every alcoholic when faced with these propositions? Well, yeah, that's all fine, but what about me? When's somebody gonna make amends to me? When's somebody gonna pay me some money? Right? That's a well, self centered in the extreme. That's I think that's our default position is me. And Alcoholics Anonymous is asking me to a self centered guy to do something very hard is to set myself aside. You can serve yourself and get what you always get when you serve yourself. Or you can serve a power and a set of principles and an ethic and a purpose greater than yourself. But if you're an alcoholic of my type, I'm telling you, you're going to serve something. And if you don't serve something greater than yourself, whether it's a set of principles and a purpose and a power, then you're going to serve yourself. But I don't think we have a choice. I think we must serve something. And most of us have served ourselves for most of our lives. And, and the, the, the great question, if you've been doing that, to ask yourself is simply, how's that been working? How's that been working? It's been going real well for you. Happy, joyous, free. Great relationships with people. Life keeps soaring. How's that working for you? And if you're an alcoholic of my type and you have the spiritual malady I got and you're reaping what you reap, the same thing I reap when I'm running my life on self-will, the answer is, oh, it's not working very well. <laughs> it's working so good that I was standing on a bridge not too long ago trying to figure, get enough courage to kill myself. That's how well it was working. 
that's how well it was working. Scott, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Bob. I, I was reminded of a, of a great truth in my own case. I heard someone else say one time, when I first got here, what I wanted to do was to work the promises and hope the steps came true. <laughs> that... That, that my history my history is to find out who I think you want me to be and then go be that. So I hear him reading the nine step promises, so I'm gonna go be the guy that's that way. See, because I, I just I don't have any idea what I'm doing. And twice in this chapter it talks uh, it references uh, this idea of going to any links. I've been to a lot of meetings that talk about going to any links, and it misses a, I think what's a relatively important piece of that same sentence on page fifty eight says, if you've decided you want what we have, and I want to go in to get it, then they tell us what that link is. It says, then you are ready to take certain steps. I wonder what steps they could possibly be referring to. Is there any chance at all that it's these 12? <laughs> that that is the any link that we're talking about. Um, I find five prayers um, in the reading. The, uh, the text sort of blends. Steps 8 and 9 together, I find five prayers. The first one's on page 76, immediately before that. Um, It used to be there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, If we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes. That's a prayer. There's another one on page uh, 79 that he he just covered. Um, We ask that we be given the strength and direction to do the right thing. So we want the top of page 80 in the second line. Am I going fast enough? Okay, good. Thank you. Good. If we have obtained permission, consulted with others, ask God to help. And the drastic step is indicated we must not shrink. This is where somebody else could be involved. Um, There's another one on page 82, about eight lines down. This one is one of my favorites. What a perspective. Listen to the perspective in this thing. Each might pray about it. They're referencing where somebody's been unfaithful. And now we're trying to come back together. Each might pray about it with this perspective, having the other one's happiness uppermost in mind. What a perspective for prayer. Wow. And then on the facing page, the same distance down, it says, So we clean house of the family, asking each morning in meditation that our Creator show us the way of patience, tolerance, kindliness, and love. So there are five prayers that I found. I'm not saying there aren't more. Those are just what I've found so far. This is part of how I work with a new guy on this thing. Um, I remind him, once he's got his eight-step list, and we're going to get down and we're going to go over that list one at a time, I want to know what the harm was you did to this person because that's what you have to amend is the harm that you did. A lot of times there are people on this list they didn't hurt. I've had people come up to me and make amends to me because they said I thought I was a jerk in the past. I didn't get much out of that. And uh, so I don't need you to go do that to somebody. What was the harm? And then let's talk about what that amend would look like. What does that look like? And this, this is my, this is red flags. This is me. I think if you take the fourth breath when you're making amends, you've already said too much. Amends is not a lecture course. Do not mess this amend up with an excuse. And if you talk long enough, you're going to give them an excuse and it's going to take all the power away. I restrict the amount I sponsor from using the word sorry. They don't believe you anymore. You wore that out decades before I met you. You will say, I was wrong, or I believe I harmed you, or both of those together is a nice combination. And uh, and I say, your mother doesn't need to hear your fist step. I made some mistakes. I believe I've done some damage to you. I'd like to make it right. Would you tell me how? Simple enough. We are not asking you to turn your will and life over to the care of someone who may roundly hate you. That person is not final authority on what this amend is. I, as your sponsor, am final authority on that. If you'd gone to Big Ken Sweeney to make amends to him before he got sober, he would have bashed you for the rest of your life. Right? So we're not asking you to do that. Um, And if he tells you what it needs to be and it makes sense to you, I empower you. Go get it. If not, you say, I'll talk to my sponsor and get back to you. And we'll talk about it. It doesn't happen often. But it does happen. Um, I like to start guys sponsoring when I get them to step nine. That's where I start them sponsoring. If I haven't started them before, and sometimes I do, and I I trust the guidance. I believe God blesses sponsorship. And uh, by this time, he's really got a message. 
He's, he's got some, he can coach somebody into this part that he's done. He's got a message to carry. And there's American philosopher uh, named William Glasser said that the human being has these needs, to give love, to receive love, to do something that matters, and to get some kind of credit for having done something that matters. And I believe sometimes that credit can just come from God when I keep it quiet myself, when I really do anonymity, which is keeping it quiet. Uh, so so he's, he's ready to give at this point. And he says, well, I don't think I'm ready. I say, good, I hope you don't ever think you're ready. I hope you don't ever think you're ready to sponsor. I hope I don't think I am. I better get God's help on every one of these. This is important stuff. And we're going to go, and I'm not going to have any trouble at all finding a new guy for him. They're not hard. Stand in the door at your home group and shake hands, ask questions. Oh, you don't have a sponsor? Come let me introduce you to your temporary sponsor. He doesn't know he can say no to that. Come here. (laughs) I got a friend that's been another guy's temporary sponsor for 22 years. They're both still sober. I have any problem with that temporary sponsor thing at all. It doesn't bother me a bit. I think it's a wonderful concept. Yeah, because that guy can't make a commitment. He doesn't need a commitment. He needs a sponsor. Temporary sponsor. Change if you need to. It's not a problem with me. Here's your first assignment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll be your temporary sponsor. I'll be glad to. Um, <laughs> and, and and then and I say to him, okay, I mean, the reason I started him sponsoring is one of the problems I have is keeping him moving through step nine. Right? By this, by the time we get to step nine, here we are six months into this thing, ballpark. His life has changed, right? He's been promoted at work. He's got money in the bank. Um, he can explain every dent in his car. He knows where they all came from. <laughs> his key fits in the front door. When he walks in, they don't scatter. He throws the switch. The lights come on. The phone rings. That's a miracle by itself. He answers and says it's him. There's another miracle. He's sleeping in the big bed again. Right? His motivation is gone. I asked Don not too long before he died what changes he'd seen in AA. And he said, when I got here, the focus is on recovery. Today, the focus is on sobriety. The difference is sobriety is simply not drinking today. Recovery is this whole, and it doesn't necessarily contain recovery. Recovery is this whole spiritual thing that we do that always contains sobriety. And that my job as a sponsor is the integrity of the message and to not let this guy settle for relief i got to get him all the way to recovery. By the time I get him to nine, he's got relief. So how do I keep him moving? i got two things that I do. Is one, I get him sponsoring. He sees this rookie catching up with him, and he doesn't want the rookie to get through nine before he does, I'll tell you that. Yeah. And, and the other one is I apply the one-day-at-a-time concept. This is just what I do, okay? And I say, okay, which one of these amends do you want to make first? And whatever he says suits me, fine. I don't care. Care at all where he starts. Great. Good choice. When can you call him and schedule an appointment? Why can't you call him right now? Good, good. Schedule it for today or tomorrow. Ring, ring, ring. Tomorrow at 2. Great. Call me at 2.30. 2.30. Yeah, ring, ring. Hey, yeah, how'd it go? Oh, great. He didn't even remember who you were? Yeah, well, that'll probably happen again. Um, so the amend went okay? Yeah, it did. Well, great. Who's next on the list? Oh, yeah, hey, that's a good choice. When can you call him and make an appointment? Why can't you call him right now? Call me right back. I want to know what it is. I want it within 24 hours. Oh, 2 o'clock tomorrow? Good. I'll be looking for a call at 2.30. It's a one-day-at-a-time concept applied to making amends. He looks at his list. He says to himself, I can't make 160 amends. I agree with him. He can't. Make one today. We're only 159 days away from finishing this. <laughs> it's worked for me. Um, i share a couple things that are a little bit controversial. I would prefer not to be controversial, but I have to lay it out, and this is how it is for me. I walked out of a meeting that I was in one time. I told you earlier that if I say something you disagree with that I want you to tell me because I may get a chance to learn something, I'm always on a search for that, constant search. Please, if you disagree, come talk to me. Um, And I walked out of a meeting one time, and a guy that I sponsor, his sponsor, said, I disagree with what you said in the meeting. And what I had said was that my amends to my children would never be complete, and he said, that's not right. He said, let me ask you questions. Did you go to your children and tell them what you thought you had done wrong? Did you ask them what you could do to repair the damage? Did you do it? Did you ask for their forgiveness? Did they give it? I said, uh, well, yes to all of that. He said, you're trying to be... He said, 
if you can't come off that cross right now, you can't accept their forgiveness or God's or your own. You have work to do. And that continuing to be the best father you can be is not ninth step work. It's twelfth. It's the principles in all your affairs. And he was right about that. I, I don't find, I tell you, if your sponsor's got you doing it, I'm in. I don't find living amends in this book. My amends to my children are complete. I'm trying to be the best father I can be to them today. It's not nine step work. I came down off the cross that day, and I have seen I have seen an awful lot of teenage and older children manipulating us into some very sick behaviors under the banner of you were a lousy parent in the past. And that takes that right out of the equation. I believe this is one of the great truths. Anything that's right for one person involved is also right for everyone that's involved. They may or may not like it, but it is right for them. Uh, I quit funding the party for my daughter about 15 years ago. She didn't like it. It was right for both of us. She'll tell you that today. So I'm trying to be the best dad that I can. And that uh, there was a great freedom that came to me with that. And uh, that's why I wanted to share it with you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into something else, too. And that's uh, I told you the story last night of my white light experience that my soul hit bottom. I thought about the worst thing I'd ever done. If you've done this, it's okay with you. It's okay with me. I'm not here to talk about that. What I had done as a young man is I paid for an abortion. And that festered my soul. As far as I was concerned, I'd killed one of my own children. And however you are, well, that suits me. I'm not here to talk about that. This is how it is for me. I'm sharing this only in hopes that somebody else who needs to get free will be able to. And um, I used to drink that away, the what-ifs that come behind that. And I used to drink them away. And I'm laying there in the treatment center, and I can't make it stop. And that's when my soul screamed for forgiveness and got it. And I get to step eight, and I owe amends to an unborn child, and I don't think it can be done. And I have been in the hands of big book people since my early days. Thank God. This is page 83. Some people cannot be seen. We send them an honest letter. And I was with people that knew that. And I was sat down and shown how to write that letter. Uh, I have captured it. I have written it down. Uh, I've got handouts if you want one. As we discovered earlier today, although there's writing involved in step four, the writing isn't the significant piece. It's the observations and prayers that are life-changing. In my experience, this letter, whether it's an unborn child, a grandparent, a sibling, anybody that's gone, this letter is not about writing. It is about tears. I got to you unable to cry. And there was a very masculine man in my home group, and he was crying in almost every meeting. Uh, he's a drummer, and you'd know the name of the band if I gave it to you. And I went to him one day, and I said, tell me about the tears. And he said, man, somebody says something beautiful in the meeting, and it, it, it touches my heart, and I weep, and it feels so good. And I said, man, I can't cry. He said, I will teach you. And he did. And it took me a year to get the first tear out. And now I can just let it run, and I wouldn't take anything for that. Because, you see, I'm convinced that my emotions are how my spirit communicates with my mind and my body. And I can't afford to block that channel because I've had the experience of the mind and the body running the show. That's how I qualified to sit with you nice people. I need to have the spirit involved. And that's where the emotions are. And, um, and he taught me to cry. And I can cry. And I need to. And it's good for me. When I've had a good cry, I feel like my soul's had a, a warm shower and dried off in the sunlight. It's just a one. I was talking to another guy here. And I don't remember who it was. Just a, a wonderful thing, how, how good it is for me. And I typed that up. It's on the same piece of paper. And if you'd like to learn to cry, I can teach you. It works for everybody. I, would, I need to warn the guys, however. If you start crying at appropriate times and places, you will attract a lot of very healthy women. Do not call me and complain about this. I have, I have, I told you on the front end, I told you up front, do not call me with that one. And if you're married, don't worry about it. Healthy women are, are not a threat to a marriage. All right? All right ladies, I, I'd like a simple answer, yes or no. Are you sick of the John Wayne acts that many of the guys are doing? Yes. They see right through it, fellas. Sorry. Okay? And when they see a guy that's in touch with their, his emotions, it lights them up like pinball machines. I'm going to leave that alone for right now. But I'm going to tell you that that's, that's the deal because they're into genuine. They really are into genuine. It's amazing. And I was shown how to write that letter, and I wrote it, and I got free. I got absolute. Can you see it? Can you see it on me? I can talk about that. And these aren't. this is not pain you're seeing on me. 
I'm free. I got absolutely free. Page 124. This painful past may be of infinite value to other families still struggling with their problem. We think each family which has been relieved owes something to those who have not, and when the occasion requires, each member of it should be only too willing to bring former mistakes, no matter how grievous, out of their hiding places. That's what that was about. That's why I did that fourth column in the sexual misconduct inventory for you. I become two things as I do these steps. I become a caddy and I become an apprentice messenger. I'm an apprentice messenger in step 12 where it says we tried to carry this message. I figure if I was a messenger, I'd be carrying it. It says I'm trying. I'm an apprentice messenger and I'm a caddy. And I still carry all that poison from my past, but it no longer has stench or weight. And the thing that keeps it light and airy is my willing for God to use it as a tool to help you. And that's what happens. And what happened with me in step five, the first time I told it all, it was, became possible for me to tell it a second time. And when I told it the second time, it became possible for me to tell it the third time. And eventually it got to where I tell it to a, a, a few thousand every year. And I just became okay with it. I do not have the power to make a mistake so ugly that God can't turn it into something magnificent. You got somebody that's gone. And don't hear that political thing, please. I'm not into that. I hope you see that. If you got somebody that's gone and you need to get free, I can show you how. It's been my experience that people who write those letters and can't cry get sinus infections and they don't get well. They don't get free. That the tears were the critical piece for me and for the, I've had the privilege of working with a lot of people. I just, just did one a couple of days ago. And I watched him cry and really, really pump that stuff out. And I haven't talked to him since. I'm his grand sponsor. But I bet he's a different man today. You can absolutely get free. Absolutely get free. Don't discount this thing. I serve a powerful God that gave me a powerful program. Don't doubt it. Don't doubt it. One of the difficult ones for guys, and I, I'm doing this the best I can, and I'll appreciate coaching if somebody has some, is if he has availed himself lightly of some lady's charms, is how do you go back and make amends for that without making her feel cheap? This is the best I can do with it. The first thing is you make sure that you're not going to do any harm on the way in. If she's married, then you find some woman to make the approach kind of thing. Um, and sometimes the best thing you can do is leave it alone. But, but I believe the thing that I say, what I have said is, I wasn't as good a friend to you as I could have been, and I'm ashamed of that. I think I've done some damage. I'd like to repair it. Can you tell me how? That's enough. That's enough. This is not a lecture course. Um, this is a gift from Miss Linda. She had been in Al Anon a number of years. She had been completed her ninth step, was sure she had, and just she got to nine again and couldn't get past it and prayed, was given a gift that she calls good amends. And she and I have talked. She's going to tell her story tonight at seven. She asked me to do this piece because I always do it when Bob and I do this. And that is, you know, I think of all the sins of commission, the things I did that hurt people. The thing I miss is the things I should have done that I didn't do. And that is typically to say thank you. She went back and thanked a high school teacher that got her off the back row, got her in school affairs, and probably prevented a teenage suicide. And I went back and thanked my major professor in college and went back and thanked the guy that taught me to fly that set off my Air Force career. He set it up. I'm a distinguished graduate of Air Force pilot training. That's top 10%. He taught me. He was hard on me and saved me. I went back and thanked him. I thank my mother for being the best mother she could be. I went back and said, thank you. I never told you how important you were to me and how much you mean to me. What a positive influence you were on my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I run into uh, previous sponsors. I've had several, and I always thank them when I see them, every time I get the chance. Uh, Ms. Linda calls it good amends. Boy, if you haven't tried that, I recommend it highly. Um, I had an experience. There was a, there's a guy in my life who was um, he was a special forces guy. All right? He was on the ground in Laos when the president was swearing we weren't there. And he took the hill tribesmen from crossbows to M16s and led them in combat for two years. This guy doesn't know how many times he's killed with his hands. And he was doing some things that I knew about that I shouldn't have known about, but I did. And I was drunk one night and said something about it, and he, he confronted me, and I lied my way out of it. And then I get sober. And now i got to go make amends to this guy. 
and he comes to Nashville for a trade show. You know, we're old buddies. And I call him and say, i got to talk to you. He said, come on down. And I can remember standing outside his motel door knowing that there's a chance I'll be dead in the next ten minutes. Because if this guy decides to kill me, I can't do anything about it. There's no way in the world I can stop that. And I asked God to go with me on this thing. And I just walked in and told him what had happened. A month later, my wife and I were guests in his home for a week. Don't discount the power of this thing. If you want to strengthen a muscle, what do they tell you to do? Use it. You want to strengthen your faith? Welcome to Steps 8 and 9. We'll... uh, one of the things we've been asked here, we are, we are not being good guests. And um, we are the only big book some of these people are going to see. Our failure to show up on time for meals is creating problems for the other retreats. I've been asked to make this announcement. We need to go down there. Our meal is scheduled at 530. We need to go there. We don't need to straggle because we're, we're hurting them. And uh, so I think we need to do that. We're, gonna, we're not finished with step nine. Uh, we're going to get into the heavy stuff. After so, we're <laughs> we're not finished with it. We got some other things we want to talk about. But in the interest of doing what we've been asked to do, we're going to go ahead and leave. I would ask if uh, can I go into the prayer? Mm-hmm. If if y'all would stay seated, we we like the Swiss for the Lord's prayer. We hope you do. But if you don't, we're going to do it anyway. Because uh, <laughs> there are no adults here to stop us. Um, if you would, we'll have a few moments of silence. We'll whisper the Lord's Prayer in a fairly slow cadence. Amen is the last word. We'll have a moment of silence after. Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever and ever. God bless us all. I will, uh, I'll have those handouts I told you about after supper. So we can head on down. Let's go eat.